fishing boat in the upper left and reads old trees, uh, trees showing the effect of winter, by the way. The trees are, the leafy trees are bare for the most part, or almost bare, and so on. And in the lower left, uh, a, um, a, a merchant or a richer man, anyway, somebody who's not a denizen there, but passing through uh, on, a, on a donkey. <clears throat> we'll see the people who are with him in just a moment. Yes, let's go on to the next one. Then next, the next one, you see the um, two, two, his two concubines who accompany him on the trip. They are riding mules, rather sad-looking mules, sad looks on the mules' faces, and they, uh, pair, they're paired, that is, facing in different directions, and with that kind of space between them, we've seen just numerous examples of this all the way back to the Han Dynasty. And then two servants carrying their luggage, who are also paired in the same way, low-class figures, uh, rather shabbily dressed and blowing on their hands and uh, obviously shivering with cold. The ladies are warmly dressed and have hats and so on. Uh, okay, and then beyond them, the river, which is drawn in uh, gray, green, that has ink wash with a touch of green color added, and, uh, <clears throat> and with wave patterns showing the wind. In fact, the wind is indicated by the blowing of the bamboo, by the blowing of the reeds, by everything. Up in the upper left, by the way, there's another fisherman here standing outside his house with his boat beside him. And on the right, the middle right, over here, I'll have a detail of that here. Uh, here is a detail. Uh, we see uh, three fishermen raising a net. Uh, they are in front of their simple hut, uh, woven grass shelter. Behind them reeds or uh, grass blowing in different directions as the wind blows across them. Very effective and moving. Scattered over the whole painting, by the way, is a kind of scatter of white, which is the snow falling. You see the snow also on trees and elsewhere. And uh, we read of artists who are able to blow through a tube to produce this. There are different ways to do it, or spatter with a brush, different ways. Now, what they are operating is a, uh, an apparatus for raising the net. It has a, um, the net is uh, held at four corners by uh, bam, presumably long bamboo poles, and then the whole thing is raised on by a kind of rope, which passes over a, um, well, a, um, a, ra ra a raised pair of, of uh, poles here, attached at the bottom. Anyway, and they, and by pulling on that rope, they're able to raise the, the uh, net and with the fish in it. That is, they lower it, they wait for the fish to come in, and they raise it, that's how they catch their fish. Okay, so the, the, the painting tells us a lot of things about the, um, about the lives of the fishermen and how they fish and everything else, as though, as I say, you were there and able to really investigate. So it really works extremely well in just the way uh, the, uh, the 12th century catalog says it will. The next speech, please. Here's a, I'm not, I'm not showing all the sections, but I'll show most of them anyway. Two fishermen down on the left with another kind of net, uh, some fishermen in boats up above, a pair of boats, a willow tree blown, a scatter of white, and so on. I remember this was in the Chinese Art Treasures exhibition. And I remember Alex Soper, Alexander Soper, very great, famous uh, art historian teaching at Institutes of Fine Arts and elsewhere. And um, I talked about him in the first lecture. Alex Soper asking me, Jim, why is this such an important painting? doesn't look all that great to me, or something like that. Well, it doesn't, it's not a painting that is very strong compositionally, and it's, I, I found it rather hard to answer his question, except to try to give, stammer out some kind of account of why I think it's a very fine painting um, that would uh, answer his question. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm doing it, but I'm, I'm trying to explain what it is about the painting that makes it unique, really, and amongst surviving Chinese paintings. It seems to be, as I say, a genuine 10th century work. The next, please. Here, um, uh, uh, two, two uh, people in a, uh, <clears throat> in, a, uh, um, in, a, in a boat and, one, one, and uh, another one uh, raising a net or getting fish out of it, probably with another kind of net, uh, fishing the, taking the fish out of the raised net. And back in the far, in the top, you see more, more fishermen and, and all the rest. 
uh, the horizon is well up above the top of the scroll, so you're, you're actually looking very closely and carefully and close up, as it were, as if you were somehow making your way along the river and able to see things. This is though, in our time, we would think you'd had binoculars or a telescope were observing all this very closely. The old tree here with snow on it and with all the, nearly all the uh, leaves or tendrils is probably a willow tree. Uh, so only a few darkened and still left. The next. <clears throat> here, um, another, another fisherman with his net. A large seal in the upper part. That is Emperor Huizhen. No, it isn't. It probably, uh, uh, anyway, it's a uh, Qing seal. But written next to it by the Emperor Huizhen, apparently in his hand anyway, Shun Pin Shang, I guess it's his, uh, meaning the top class in the now the the divine class top grade, each of the classes was divided into three, so it was a nine grade system, and this would be, he was putting this in the very top, uh, and which it deserves I think. This is a wonderful, wonderful painting. Okay, uh, the whole the whole space of the painting occupied mostly by this gray green river, wind ruffled river, uh, and things spaced out across this space. There's something Tong about that. If we look at more, if I had showed more Tong compositions, things at Dunhuang and so on, we would have seen that Tong painters like to space, scatter their interesting places across a wide area. Over at the left here is a kind of fish trap uh, through which the fish are driven through this space in the middle into another net. And as we look at the next one, we see the the people who are waiting to take the fish out of the trap. And these are two young fishermen uh, in the lower right here, huddled in their hut, uh, built up on poles over the water, shivering with cold, uh, very scantily dressed, their boat down below. And then beyond in the upper left, you see a boat going by. And from the bright colors you see inside, you can guess that these are uh, well-off people, merchants, travelers, something, being pulled by boatmen and um, uh, making their way along the river. So you have very clear distinction of social economic class. They wouldn't call it that. They wouldn't use any such heavy terms, but it's what's happening. The artist makes it clear there are people who live there and people who move through. And this, we'll see, is a very uh, uh, pervasive theme in landscape painting generally, you know, through the Song Dynasty also. A very clear distinction between the people who live in a place and the people who are moving through it as travelers. Okay, the next please. Uh, here's a detail. I had this in my scribble book. This is the section I reproduced with these two uh, young fishermen huddling and their net raising apparatus in front of them. If they pull on the rope, the thing will, uh, the net will raise and so on and their boat down below, drawn in, well, you see, very clear three-dimensional way. Um, the land masses are painted in rather heavier gray-green, as if they have sort of some kind of vegetation on the top, and then you see the reeds and the water ruffled, the next. Then toward the end of the scroll here, um, we, um, uh, throughout the scroll, the there's a nice balance between the setting and the human element. Neither of them really dominates. Neither of them would be sufficient alone. They're inter interdependent to a degree that's very hard to match in other painting. We don't have a lot of painting of this kind. We feel throughout this whole picture a sort of sympathetic observation um, which uh, underlies the imagery of the painting. Uh, okay, uh, there's toward the end, as I say, and now we arrive at something more communal, uh, that is the fishermen are clustered together, two, uh, two boats, a group of them, and in one of the boats there's a fire, a cooking fire presumably, with smoke and sparks rising from it. Um, and then down below, uh, the lower left, a fisherman returning. And then uh, around them, this another old willow tree with snow on it above them, and then the, the water stretches out past the upper limit of the scroll as, as elsewhere. Um, well, the, one of the, 
the, the strong points of this painting is that uh, the, although the, the, the fishermen and are shown in their daily occupation pretty much, they are not simply sitting around and enjoying life. In later paintings of fishermen, in the, mm, in the Yuan Dynasty, fishing becomes something that the elegant gentleman enjoys when he's not in his official duties. And in later painting, in the Ming and Cheng, fishermen are seen most often as, as enjoying a kind of ideal life in nature, uh, enjoying convivial gatherings on the shore, drinking, and leading the kind of ideal life that uh, uh, has no, no real relationship to the real life of a fisherman. They have used the term pastoral. They serve the same kind of function as pastoral imagery does in Europe, as a kind of imagined uh, simple life away from the contaminating world and so on. But nobody in later times is interested in the kind of themes that Zhao Gan uh, gives us here. Okay, then here is the very end of the scroll uh, showing that scene with the, as I say, the fire in the boat, the uh, smoke rising sparks. You could, you could talk about mm, realism if you want to. I mean, they've gone a long, long way toward being able to represent things as you would see them much more accurately than earlier painters. I could talk about that in a sort of gumbrick way. Um, and Zhao Gan obviously developed the skill to a very high point, partly by observation, partly by endless, endless practice, by producing paintings of this kind probably in great numbers uh, as a specialty of his. Okay, enough of that. Uh, wonderful painting. And then in the section to be the, the uh, mounting silk afterwards, yellow and white, you see the seals of mm, important uh, co collectors and uh, uh, imperial and other. Here's the seal again saying Jun Yu Jung Bi, to be treasured among the myriad trades, seal of the 12th century Jin Emperor. Okay, end of the scroll. From here on, this lecture is going to follow a roughly follow. The arguments that I make in an article I published in 1980, and that was based on a paper I presented at an international conference on Sinology held at the Academia Sinica in Taipei the year before. Now, this text is accessible still on my website, CLP, Cahill Lectures and Papers, number 190, 190. You can download that with illustrations. It was titled, Some Aspects of Tenth Century Painting as Seen in Three Recently Published Works. Uh, but I wasn't able to do it with so many illustrations I can now, so it's going to be very different in a way. Now, <clears throat> on the screen, and I'll leave it here for a while while I talk, is a painting that was found in a 10th century tomb. And I'll talk about that in just a moment, and uh, just how, uh, about the painting and show another one. But um, I began this article by noting that when we, when we try to understand the great development of Chinese landscape painting in the 10th century, Typically, we start out by looking at the works attributed to the five great masters of that period, artists named Jing Hao and Guangtong, Dong Ran and Zhu Ran, Li Cheng. Uh, my next lecture, lecture six, will be about paintings attributed to them. Anyway, we start out looking at the paintings that are ascribed to these five great masters, and we end up, I think, contemplating a lot of works that are really later in date. We don't have any reliable works by any of these. Maybe works that can be tentatively said to be a, maybe of that period, but nothing reliably by any one of them. Instead, I proposed, what, what would happen if we looked at some paintings that are reliably of the period, the five dynasties, that seem not so much to anticipate the future, so much as to represent a culmination and maybe termination of a long period leading up to this time. And then I developed my argument accordingly, and I found in these works a fascination that was never to be equaled afterwards with creating intricate spatial schemes, spaces beyond spaces. I've already talked about that in the double screen painting and the